Welcome. Um, I'm David Sturman, a senior policy analyst here at New America. We're here to discuss um, extremism and domestic terrorism in the wake of the Capitol siege and also what led up to it. At New America, we've been tracking um, terrorism and extremism of many kinds, including far right extremism for about a decade. One of the things we've been doing is tracking deadly attacks that are politically motivated inside the United States by people who profess or demonstrate such a motivation from any major ideology. According to our data since or in the post 9-11 era, we've noted um, attacks killing 114 people motivated by the far right writ broadly that includes anti-government, militia movement, anti-abortion violence, as well as um, explicitly racist and white supremacist um, terrorism. But we're not here to only discuss the broader one. On January 6th, there was, of course, the riot at the Capitol that breached the Capitol building. I think very shocking to many people. Um, in the wake of that, at least 59 people have been charged, according to the last time I checked. Um, among those charges was an individual who drove a vehicle to um, DC and in that vehicle when searched were firearms and 11 Molotov cocktails. There were firearms on and in the sort of vicinity of the Capitol carried by various riders. Um, there were at least two individuals, but more, um, two who have been charged, I believe, who had plastic handcuffs um, on them when they breached the Capitol. But there's also a number of charges for um, just illegal entry for the Capitol as well. In addition, um, the US has announced that it's examining further charges and specifically created a task force to potentially pursue sedition charges and look at more serious charges that may be tied to um, broader organizing or broader efforts within the riot. Um, to discuss this and the events at the Capitol, how we got here, where we go from here now, we have Javed Ali, who is a New America International Security Program fellow and a former senior director on the National Security Council for Counterterrorism. We have Arif Ali Khan, who has a 25 year history um, on working on many of these issues, including years as a federal prosecutor, um, being the deputy mayor for Los Angeles for Homeland Security issues and as assistant secretary for policy development at the Department of Homeland Security. And we have Janet Redman, a journalist contributor to New York Times Magazine, who wrote a major cover story on extremism, the um, failures and ways law enforcement has responded to far right extremism in particular, and who is writing a book on the subject. Um, and we'll have a lot from the various reporting that has gone into that. To start us off, I'm going to ask all three to give us sort of a sense of their initial reaction to the events at the Capitol, what they think happened, how it should be understood. And from that, we'll go into a number of more specific questions before um, taking your questions and answers, which you can submit via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom. With that, Javed, why don't you take it away? Well, David, thanks for having me and thanks to New America, um, Peter Bergen and the rest of the team here for, for putting this event together. And it's truly an honor to share the virtual stage with Arif and, and Janet, so really glad to be here. But um, just to kind of kick things off, let me um, help uh, folks kind of frame how we got to last week. And the way I've thought about it, and I even thought about this last Wednesday is that there were four key sort of factors or drivers that I think worked in uh, combination to get us to last Wednesday. So very quickly, uh, the first was the impact of COVID. So even going from January, 2020 to where we are in January, 2021. So over that year stretch, the impact of COVID and all the restrictions that have come with that and perceptions of what government can do, the federal government, state and local government to restrict your liberty uh, in, in lots of different ways. So that's the first one. The second one, um, over that same period of time, 
this deepening sense of political, cultural, and social polarization in the country. And again, backing up uh, a year from where we are now, we had the impe first impeachment uh, trial uh, or proceedings of President Trump. We had um, uh, the Black Lives Matter and social justice uh, movements from the summer. We had the 2020, November 2020 elections. And then what came out of the uh, November elections with the, the claims that the vote uh, was rigged or was um, false. So you know, that was a, a contributing factor. Thirdly, um, was uh, or still is the, the high level of disinformation, misinformation, fake news, propaganda, whatever you want to call that. Um, but over the, you know, this past year, there just seemed to be more of it. And it seemed not to be just um, coming from the fringe elements of society. Um, this was, had now become very mainstream from uh, elected officials at the state, local level, and now the federal level, members of Congress, and then all the way into the White House up to the president, right? So that was so significant. And then I would say the last um, key factor that impacted arguably the other three was the ability uh, of social media platforms to host these narratives, these beliefs, these ideas, and let people discuss them openly, um, organize in a virtual world, and sometimes even plot um, terrorist uh, attacks or, or potential terrorist attacks. So those are the four factors that I think got us to last week. I guess I'll go next, David. Okay, well, thank you, David, and thank you to New America for having me here. It's great to be on this uh, panel with my friends here. Um, I guess from my perspective, I kind of look at this in three different ways and maybe framing the issues for our discussion today. Um, I mean, first, I think we have to recognize that I said on a national level, um, all of us just as Americans and human beings are just uh, shaken by everything that we've seen happen. We may have thought it could happen. We may have on a clinical level, an analytical level thought this was inevitable given all that we've known and all we've worked on for so long. But I just think as a, as a country and as individuals, especially with everything else that's going on in, in not just the United States, but the world, I think this has hit us on an emotional level that certainly we haven't had since 9-11. And I think that's something because it overlays, I think a lot of the issues we're gonna talk about of how did we get to this place what are we doing now? What is the environment? And also something we have to take into consideration moving forward. I think the second thing is more on the professional level, at least my profession and, and us on the panel is looking at it and what happened. Um, the security failures, the failure to protect it, it, such a critical infrastructure, um, the, the loss of life, uh, what happened that day that shouldn't have happened and how do we make sure it doesn't happen in the future um, from just a security and a policing perspective uh, on such an important location. And then I think the third thing is, well, what does this all mean? What does this all mean now? And what does it mean going into the future? Not just from a governmental level and a law enforcement level, how are you gonna deal with this, but also where does the community come in? How does the political uh, world come in? And I, I'm also very, uh, it'll be interesting to see how much does this reach out more even internationally? Um, and some of the issues, just talking to some friends overseas. So I think there, there's a lot of emotion and, and uh, sort of logistical and operational things here that make it very complex. And I think I'm sure we'll get into a lot of these issues in this panel. Okay, I guess I'll go, hi. <laughs> um, so I was, not, um, I was not surprised by what I saw um, on the sixth, I was not. I was not in a meeting. I was not surprised that a, a, an angry mob of people who had been riled up by Donald Trump um, and other polarizing rhetoric in this country, for you know, that you can find on on social media, that you can find on um, you know YouTube and and its precursors of talk radio, going all the way back to the 1990s in some cases. Um, that, that that this would snowball to to a place where they would. You know, storm the Capitol in some in some belief that this was defending the government. This is part of a kind of a conversation that's been happening on the right for many, many, many years. What surprised me was that law enforcement caved; that the Capitol actually kind of gave way. And so that, to me, is an indication of how um, not only how how law enforcement and 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 military veterans have. Um, become very much embedded in this movement, 
but um, but also how how I guess what we want to call white supremacy, um, but uh, I'm not sure that that's exact. I, I mean that in the broadest of terms, how that has kind of baked itself into um, the political right, the conservative right, which is very much subscribed to by by law enforcement and and you know and the military. I mean, not not that everybody is a crazy MAGA, um, you know, QAnon supporter. But these are by, you know, in many ways, you, you, you know, very conservative institutions. There's, there's been tremendous support for, you know, for the president in both of these institutions. And it really made me think, you know, wow, this is really, some of this stuff has baked itself right into their culture. And, and I'm very interested, I'm personally, as journalist, I'm interested in knowing exactly what happened because I think it, it's, it's much more than, you know, Viking man and, bear, you know, bearskin man and, and some of the more flamboyant, people that, that storm the Capitol. So I think that, you know, in my view, um, I think this should open a national conversation about extremism and the law, its long tail and the many events that have led up to this and also about terrorism and the impact of the war on terror on this country and on a kind of a psychological and sort of psychic level. I'm, I'm writing a book that, that addresses a, a kind of the social unraveling of our country um, in the post 9-11 era. And there are specific benchmarks that you can look at and you can, you know, that I think are very important and, and, um, and they need to be addressed. And, and I think that, you know, we don't have enough of an appreciation really of history. And I think that's hugely important to kind of grasp this because this isn't just a kind of a one-off event, um, like Jeff I was saying. So those are kind of my broad ideas. Thank you all. Um... Well, before we get into some of the discussion of how we got here, I think it might be useful to um, define some terms or at least try and define some terms. No one loves the definitions debate, but I think we'll find that it actually matters in a lot of this, or at least is informative as to how the government thinks about these issues. So, um, I'd like to throw out sort of three lenses to all three of you to talk about how you define it, whether you think they're distinct lenses, um, and what they show or don't show, moving from sort of the narrower to perhaps the broader, or at least that's how I think about it. So to start with, um, what is domestic terrorism, or how do you understand terrorism in the context of this? Um, how is it investigated by the government? And I guess to start, I just throw some broad context that I think many people understand terrorism through the United States' um, war on terrorism, um, generally understood, although not quite necessarily accurately, as having begun in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And in particular, there's the whole material support structure tied to a list of foreign groups that you're not allowed to provide any kind of material support to. Um, Al-Qaeda, ISIS and its various affiliates, a couple other things. Um, recently, apparently, they're moving to put the Houthi rebels in Yemen onto that list, but that's not really how it gets applied here. In the U.S., um, as I understand it, and we'll see um, how this gets interpreted by our speakers, there isn't a single domestic terrorism charge, although there is a definition of domestic terrorism, at least one, I think actually multiple. Um, but there are a number of acts that are labeled or charges that are understood as terrorism charges or terrorism related charges, perhaps most notably for what we're discussing here, um, attacking federal buildings or assassinating Congress people. And those could conceivably be charged either with a generic material support to terrorists, which is distinct from the foreign terrorist organization list, or with the variety of sort of conspiracy attempting charges that apply to most crimes or all crimes. Um, so why don't we start with Javed or, or whichever one of you and then um, the rest of you with what happens when the government label something or understand something as domestic terrorism? And what does that mean 
is it sufficient? And what would you call domestic terrorism? Uh, thanks, David, for, for teeing all that up. There's a lot to unpack there. So I'm going to try and take a couple bits and, and obviously Janet and RF will weigh in too. But um, just looking at the events of last week, in my own mind, what I've tried to sort of parse out is, or are, um, what sort of activity fits under a legal definition of terrorism or even domestic terrorism, and then what analytically sort of sort of could theoretically be described as terrorism. And I think you get different answers when you when you start to sort of look at the events of last week for those two different frameworks. So on the legal side, as you mentioned, David, um, there is no current statute from which to charge domestic terrorism, but there is a definition of domestic terrorism is captured by an R if you may, um, you, can, uh, you can kick me virtually if I get it wrong, but I believe it's 18 USC 2331. And then under that um, code, there's a, a five part definition of what constitutes an act of domestic terrorism. But I don't believe that there's a, there's a charge you can bring if someone were to be, if that statute were to be used. Uh, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a former prosecutor like Arf. Um, so that, that is an issue. And David, as you mentioned, there is no uh, equivalent to the foreign terrorist organization list that it already exists, managed by the State Department, and then is linked to that material support um, uh, part of US code as well. So that's another thing that makes the foreign terrorism or some of the tools that we have on the foreign terrorism side so different when it comes to uh, domestic terrorism. Is this something that the Biden administration is going to try and tackle um, either with a more sort of robust definition of domestic terrorism that is linked to something that looks like material sport, or even more controversially, something that looks like a list of domestic terrorist organizations list, uh, domestic terrorist organization list. These are all things that people have talked about, and there are, you know, they're pretty fierce debates on either side of that. So that's, I think, how I look at uh, uh, sort of state of play um, legally. And as far as I, I know, no one, even for the events of last week, has been charged with any federal terrorism related matters, right? So that's something um, that we'll just have to keep watching. But then on the, on the Atlantic side, you could make the argument that um, some of the activity from last week, whether it was the destruction of property, um, assaults against police officers, the murder, you know, the tragic murder of the one Capitol police officer through violent action, um, you could make the argument analytically those activities look like acts of domestic terrorism. So not the protests themselves, but again, storming of the Capitol, physical destruction, attacks against law enforcement, um, and then um, you know, potential um, uh, operational sort of uh, planning that was going on beforehand. So that's where I think there's this divide between what you can bring, um, what you can bring on the legal side, but what you can sort of analytically um, describe as, as um, terrorist related activity. So I'll stop there and turn it over to, uh, to Arif and Janet. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that just from on the sort of the legal issue. And, and I agree with Javed, uh, there isn't something directly that you would charge dom domestic terrorism. Um, and that's been a debate that's been going on for a long time, not only just with that, but with international terrorism. I do, before I get to that though, I do want to make one um, comment about the issue of how we frame what's going on now and the analogies to what happened after 9-11 and sort of the terms of the war on terror. I, I mean, I, there's been a lot of debate about whether we wanted to do that then and certainly whether we should do that now. But I, I do want to make the distinction is we were literally at war um, as a result of 9-11 with military operations, obviously in Afghanistan, ultimately in Iraq and elsewhere. Um, where there was a major role of the military and those types of kinetic operations that were going on. Um, I don't anticipate that. I don't expect that. I don't see any need for something like that just based on what we're, we're having right now. So I think that is a big distinction in terms of what we call it. But words obviously matter. And I think that matters now. And, and I, I really do think it's time to really define the issue of domestic terrorism um, from a legal point of view that goes beyond just having it as an enhancement to another offense. Um, it, it, I understand the arguments that, you know, sometimes it's easier to just charge somebody for setting off a bomb, as opposed to adding an additional element that you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt at trial that gets into a lot of other issues, including motive and intent and those complexities. But on the other hand, the laws, especially the criminal laws, 
reflect what society condemns and what we think is, is punishable. And we have, it's taken many, many years, but we've seen that being reflected in hate crimes. Hate crimes all have an underlying crime of violence. Um, and oftentimes it's much more direct and efficient to just charge that because that's what's gonna end in the, the large penalty. But we as a society, or at least in many states have decided, no, we need to label it for what it is, which is it is a, it is a hate crime. Um, it's motivated by hate. It's motivated by things that we as a society don't accept. And I do think it's at the very least, this debate needs to happen and maybe the opportunity to make that change. Jenna, you're on mute. Jenna, do you have? So sorry, everybody. I've been I've been out of this little world for a while. Um, I think that you know my definition of terrorism, whether it's domestic or international, is or one definition of is you know has it changed behavior? Has it changed the goal of terrorism is to scare people or scare society so that it's cha it changes. Um, we, you know, arguably Bin Laden got exactly what he wanted from 9-11, looking at the way our society changed, looking at the, you know, it, it upended our culture and made us, um, in my view, a much more fearful, a much more defensive, a much more, um, in many ways, less confident country. Um, I think with, you know, you can look at, you know, the members of Congress who are afraid to vote to impeach Donald Trump because of their own constituents, their fear that their own constituents could possibly hurt them. That to me, that's, that's it to me, that's okay, then this is terrorism. If you're, if you're afraid to do something, to act in some way because of this act, then I think that, um, that that meets the criteria. And I think that terrorism is an important, I have a, I have a lot, I think it's been a very politicized term. Um, and I, I worry deeply about a domestic terrorism statute because I think that those kinds of laws are generally, um, for, for as well-intentioned as they may be, they're often used against um, um, people who, who, are, who are not part of the sort of established status quo and they, they tend to be used against, historically they've been used against the left, they've been used against people of color. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any sense of assurance that this would necessarily only be used or primarily be used against the right, the far right. Um, so I, I worry about that, but I also think that it's important to kind of to call it what it is um, in order to give it weight. Like as, as Arv was saying, it needs a sort of a societal weight that, you know, this is serious, that these, that, that you know, what we saw, you know, last week um, was terrifying. It was an attack on our, you know, la the last time Washington was attacked and it was 9-11. That was the last time, you know, this is a terror. I mean, it, it, is a, it is a weighty, serious thing that happened. Um, and so I do think that we should be talking about it in those terms. So thanks. Um, so next I want to ask you to look at it from another lens, which, um, not sure on the best phrase for it, but maybe we could call it riot control or protest policing, crowd control. Why is it that um, the crowd was able to breach the Capitol? What differentiates the sort of concerns that might exist in um, policing before the breach and then what can spiral out once people enter? Um, the Capitol. And I think one thing to look at here is in our deadly attack data um, over the sort of 2020, um, there were, I think, four, four or five deadly attacks inside the US that we saw as politically motivated. And several of those, um, I think at least three occurred in the vicinity of protests, one being the shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, one being the attack in Oakland, California by a person motivated by sort of the Boogaloo movement. And then um, um, I'm blanking on the third one. Oh, the last one being the left-wing shooting in um, Portland, Oregon, 
um, that occurred in the midst of a clash between various far right, um, at least armed with weapons, um, actors and left wing protesters. So it seemed like there was should have been a sense that these kinds of protests have it. Throw onto that the Michigan armed protests that look awfully like a early version of this. What do you get out of the sort of protest policing frame? Well, I, I can take that. Um, I mean, I think it's 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 a lot more complex than I think people realize. We saw that um, during the protests over the summer, and we've seen it in many other protests uh, that various departments have been involved with over the years in Los Angeles, where I'm very familiar with. I, I think. I think, though, that the capital situation is very unique for a number of reasons, and I and I think we all agree there were multiple points of failure here, uh, the result in loss of life and incredible damage to the capital and injuries. Um, but I think also I always think it's always very important to analyze these things from the context in which they're operating, because policing is not the same. It's not monolithic. We have 18,000 police departments in the United States. The concentration of law enforcement agencies just within the District of Columbia is mind boggling. Um, and the, the level of coordination that, re, that is required typically is, is pretty significant, which, of which they have so much practice in doing, which I think is why it was shocking to most of us who have been in this world, is what seems to be a lack of preparation, a lack of coordination on something that seemed to be very likely to happen. I think Michael Chertoff, a former secretary, said it well recently where he said, um, you didn't need an intelligence report to know that this was possible. All you needed was a newspaper. Um, and it sounds like many people realized that, but weren't able to get the coordination, the resources they needed. I think it's important to look at the Capitol Police very differently than you would a large municipal police agency, in, in large part because their missions are very different and in many ways, many more com much more complex. You know, the Capitol Police is responsible for protecting a critical infrastructure that is a fairly large uh, complex building and buildings, because as you know, there are other buildings that are connected by tunnels where members of Congress and staff are. They have to screen millions of people every year, not in this particular situation, but typically of things and people. They do have law enforcement responsibilities to enforce the law if they come across a violation, whether it's a petty crime on the grounds of the Capitol or some serious felony that's occurring. Um, and also they have a very big responsibility of a protection detail. But unlike the Secret Service with a few people or, or you know, somebody traveling through an airport like I was used to uh, addressing when I was uh, at LAX, um, the 535 principals, leaders, elected officials that they have to protect, who often all come together at once, which is what happened plus the vice president. That is a, a very disparate set of responsibilities and roles and expertise. And then you couple onto that, or you, you pile onto that, a structure that is very different than any municipality or even county, where you have two houses of Congress who each have two different sergeant at arms who then report to a committee who then have a chief. And the chief may be the only person with any security or law enforcement experience, and then expected to do this under this just a massive political environment, COVID, all these complications. I think all of those things have to be taken into consideration because there is no single reason why what happened happened. Um, I do think that other departments are learning from that. They need to. I think that digging into this on all the levels is going to be very important as we move forward and learn how to better protect situations. But I, I hate to oversimplify it in any way that somehow the Capitol Police should have responded like the LAPD would have or another police department because their roles and responsibilities are very different. If I could jump in, um, David, not to elaborate on anything Arif said, because obviously Arif's experience is, is um, you know, very uh, acute on that, but just you know, to, to circle back to something that, um, that you talked about with uh, events here in Michigan, and that's where I physically am now, have, having spent 26 years in Washington, DC. So um, before uh, I moved back to Michigan, you know, the, the, what I would call sort of the first siege of a state house happened in Lansing last spring. Now it's again, still back in Washington. But for any of the folks listening uh, or watching who remember that, that was a fairly terrifying episode too, because you had 
people who weren't there just there to protest. They were, because of the COVID related restrictions at that point, they were there to protest fully armed and kitted out and then walked into that, you know, state house in Lansing to potentially harass or intimidate other folks. I'm actually amazed there was no violence there, the, but the potential was so high. And then the really disturbing thing was a few of the individuals who were part of that armed protest siege, that's probably the best way I can think, you know, what to call it, uh, in April in Lansing were part of either later or already the plot to kidnap Governor Whitmer that was unfolding last spring into the summer, into the fall here in Michigan as well. So events here in Michigan have showed um, what even a, you know, a handful or you know, a small group of people can do when um, they're politically sort of aggrieved, they have the capability to do great harm, um, they can self-organize and train. Um, and that Wolverine Watchman plot that again, had some origins going back to the political protests in Lansing, that was about as serious as it gets from a terrorism perspective, even though it hasn't been federally, a char the federal charges for that do not have the word terrorism in there for all intents and purposes. Again, going back to my legal versus analytic distinction, that was a terrorism plot. There's really no other way to describe it. So um, just kind of going back to um, kind of events here on the ground in Michigan, I think were instructive and telling for, uh, to a degree, what happened uh, in Washington last week. If I could just add to that, and John would correct me if I'm wrong, but that was a legal protest where you could legally carry an open firearm on the Capitol grounds. And even today, although there's some restrictions about the open carry, you're still lawfully able to carry a concealed weapon on, into the Capitol um, at, at any time that it's open. So that just adds a whole level of complexity to trying to protect a, a, a facility like that despite what's happened in the country. Yeah, that's a law that, um, I mean, no one was asking my opinion, but had they, I would have said that law needs to be rethought in the name of public safety. And um, the fact that it still hasn't gone all the way, Arf, as you mentioned, that apparently whatever you know, Michigan legislators have passed is a ban on open carry, but if you have a concealed weapons permit, you can still bring your weapon in, which again, from a public safety standpoint, just doesn't make any sense to me, but uh, I'm not sort of calling the shots in the Michigan legislature. So yeah, this is another one of these things that we're gonna have to work out on the policing front, you know, closer to ours, Bailiwick, you know, where does the water's edge kind of start and stop with, you know, First Amendment, Second Amendment, uh, and where does then public safety concerns kick in? You have things to say on this particular issue, Janet? No, just, um, yeah, just just that, that, you know, you can't, we can't forget that there were organizers who were urging, the organizers of this, um, this capital siege that were urging their followers, like, if you can't make it, go to your state capital. You know, if you're west of the Mississippi, go to your state capital. There are plenty of Democrats there that you can remind who you are. And, you know, there's a lot of open carry states. There's a lot, this is, I think that, that um, you know, that, that I really worry about the strategy that these people are using, uh, this kind of state-by-state -state strategy um, to, you know, to essentially terrorize people on a local level and at their state capitals. Um, I mean, you've seen that with other, I, mean, I, I saw that with the anti-abortion movement actually, um, and the way that they sort of just for years just blew off um, Roe v. Wade and focused on changing laws at the state level, which, which ex worked extremely well. And I worry about how these people will operate at a local level around, you know, with their local law enforcement at these, at these, you know, are they going to store in these capitals with these laws that are much more relaxed? Um, and what the and what the kind of culmination of all of that will be, you know, how will that all put, you know, ultimately build on itself over time? And I'm, I think we should be looking, you know, I'm looking at that um, as a journalist and, and asking some questions about it. Oh, so let's move to the third frame, which I think will rapidly expand into a broader conversation of a number of issues. Um, but how do we understand this through a lens of sort of extremism and the ideologies, forms of politics, beliefs um, that may even not be necessarily 
entirely understood as political, um, or at least not as people are sort of used to thinking of it in the United States. Um, frame what happened, where did this movement come from? Um, let's start with Janet just initially sort of some general overview and then I think there's a number of questions we should dig in on here on the role of racism in particular, mobilization in particular areas, but um, we'll save the deep dives on that for next. Um, so, <laughs> hope this isn't very, uh, this may be an unpopular thing to say. I, I see this as, um, we can call this white supremacy. Um, I, I see this movement as, um, as as a kind of um, um, a, a reflection of of a, of a form of white culture. Um, not every single person in that in that crowd, um, or every single person who follows the QAnon conspiracy, or who supports Donald Trump in a very aggressive MAGA kind of way, um, would call themselves a racist. Would call themselves uh, a neo Nazi. Um, there are people who are not white in that movement. There are people, there are Jewish people in that movement. Um, but um, it is a, it is to me, it is a movement that's been happening for, it's been growing and growing and sort of existing in, in, in some ways in the margins and in some places in the mainstream for many, many years. And it's a movement against change and the inevitable change, the inevitable diversification of this country. And I think that over the past 20 years in particular, um, a series of events from the war, you know, from 9-11 itself to the, to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, to the election of Barack Obama um, and the economic crisis that came along with that, you know, in that same period um, to um, Trayvon Martin and the Black Lives Matter movement, there's been a number of kind of benchmarks um, that um, have, have shaken people and have um, scared people who who are who feel as if their culture, rightly or wrongly, is being the culture that they knew, the culture that you know that I grew up with. You know, I grew up with, you know, calling the the American Indians the American, you know, the American Indians, the Indians. We thought, you know, growing up thinking Columbus, you know, was was very heroic. You know, with these kind of very traditional ideas that we all grew up with in our school books. There are people who really are very loath to give that up, um, are deeply worried that, for example, their sons, their boys, are going to be in a, are, are an oppressed class. I've heard this many times from people that that I've interviewed. That um, you know, they're, they're deeply worried that 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 you know, anyone other than a white male now has way more power, and that means that they are disadvantaged instead of just understanding that it's power being spread across and that this, is, this could be a very positive thing. And so I think that all of those kinds of factors and feelings come together in this you know, kind of chaotic, um, ex almost like an explosion that we saw the other day. I don't think that it is a, um, it is a top down in terms of a kind of this is neo-Nazi, this is white supremacy, you know, this is the Klan. It's not like that. It's a much, you know, these movements at this point are very much horizontal. And, and they always, and in many ways they always have been because the only way that they can survive, that white supremacy in particular can survive, is to, um, to constantly rebrand and constantly figure out new techniques for bringing in the mainstream. And so what you see in these, in these you see the Auschwitz guy, the guy with the Camp Auschwitz t-shirt, now we know who he is. You know, you see the guy with the Confederate flag, we know who he is. You know, then we see somebody else who's like, um, you know, the, there's, a, there's a doctor that flew on a private jet from Seattle, quite a wealthy woman. I don't know who she is. She doesn't necessarily seem like one of those people. So how did she get there? And I think it's, it, you, you really have to understand the sort of the horizontal nature of all of this in order to kind of begin to, to see that. So um, that's, that's a very brief answer to a very complicated question. Um, let's tease that apart maybe a bit. <laughs> um, in sort of differentiating, and obviously these can all be understood and maybe should be understood under one broad spectrum, but 
but if we sort of separate out for an initial discussion, people who are white supremacists in the sort of form that takes as an ideological commitment to an explicit political program of upholding white supremacy understood as doing that. Um, maybe the like Ku Klux Klan, the neo-Nazi model, um, the kind of people who would not ironically or jokingly or just, or at least when they're in private, put forward the 14 words as their political program. What is your sense of their presence in this movement and their interaction with what might be seen as um, trends that may support white supremacy in um, maintaining a system that is racist, but would not um, personally identify as such or don't understand their politics to be doing that. Um, what are sort of the balances in the movement of that? Are there tensions emerging um, between those different views? Um. I, I think that they're, they play a significant role in this movement as they've played a role in every sort of large far right movement over the past 30 years. Um, you saw this in the 1990s with the militia movement that the, the, the radical right, the, the, you know, the white supremacist neo-Nazi faction um, were a major power behind the militia movement of the 90s that was not seen as a racist movement. Um, and, but, they, but they were behind the scenes in many ways and they did not, they kind of rebranded, like I said, they kind of rebranded themselves in a way that it wasn't noticeable. Um, I think that in this situation, they're, they're actually, I know that in some quarters, of, you know, some, some sort of chat rooms and discussion boards um, where the, you know, the overtly racist white supremacist neo-Nazi factions hang out, they were thrilled by what happened at the Capitol because what they see is, okay, this is great. Now we can, you know, we've kind of like primed, primed the pump here and now we can, we can bring these people in, you know, to our way of, of you know, to our view, we'll, we'll introduce them to what they call the JQ, the Jewish question, you know, that how, you know, you need a series of events to radicalize a person. It's like being in a cult frankly, you know, indoctrination is a long process. And, um, and so there is a, uh, there's on the more extreme and radical and sort of deeply ideological sides of this movement, I think there, there is um, elation that this is happening around the country. But I think it was, it is a huge mistake to just see these people as crazy clans people or crazy Nazis. You know, white supremacy is now baked into our politics. You know, I hate to say that, but it is. I mean, it is. We have QAnon supporters who have just who are just elected to Congress. You know, this is this is part of who we are, and I think this is you know this is something that's always said on the left, but I think it needs to be said in the mainstream as well. Like, we need to look at this. This is this is not just about um, you know the Ku Klux Klan or the National Socialist Movement or you know or people who are overtly fascist or wearing you know. Uh, you know, sw or have swastika tattoos. Um, it's a much, it's a much more, it's a subtle shift. And I think we need to understand it on, on a, a number of different levels and to just kind of isolate it and say, okay, well, how much is the, the real white supremacists? How much are the real neo-Nazis playing a role in this? And maybe if we just get rid of them, we'll get rid of this problem. That is not, that's not the way to look at it at all, in my view. The Arif and Java, do you have thoughts on the broad question of the extremism frame, the um, role of racism? And let me also throw to you before we go to questions. How do these ideological questions get addressed or looked at within the government side in a country that at least um, officially tends not to like to police or doesn't want to police ideology, but certainly at least has a history of actually doing that on particular movements, but also like a legal system that there are ways that ideology does matter to crimes. For example, when you spoke about um, hate crimes, that's sort of a thought or ideological process brought through the act as part of the crime, not just the act in separation 
in terms of thought. Um, and of course, just like any crime has that. Um, I mean, we differentiate on types of murder by why you were thinking on doing it from manslaughter up to premeditated first degree, so. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, so uh, I was going to just add uh, on to what Janet said, just almost kind of reinforce her points from my own kind of observations of what's been happening is that um, whether this is a movement or a phenomena, again, I'm struggling with my own kind of way to describe it, uh, even in the classroom, right? you know, teaching counterterrorism. But um, whatever you want to call it, I would agree that it is diffuse, it's fractured, it's not monolithic. There is no command and control structure or sense of hierarchy or bureaucracy, completely different for the most part from the foreign terrorist um, side of the threat dimension, where for the most part, uh, at least in that post 9 11 uh, experience that I spent my government career in, we were dealing with formal groups that had a leadership structure and infrastructure around them and a fit, you know, physical parts of that group, either human beings or buildings or other elements that you could actually try to target or disrupt. That doesn't seem to be the case here. We're battling ideas and people's ability to internalize these ideas and then either stay highly radicalized, which getting to some of your um, questions, David, is perfectly legal in this country. Um, you can be as highly radicalized as you want as long as you don't violate the law. Um, but then some of these people have stepped over that line, right? And are committing various crimes again, whether they're terrorism or not. So this is what I think makes the, this far right threat, uh, again, whether it's a movement phenomena, um, some other word, so different than the international terrorism side of the spectrum. I think there are a couple things um, relevant to the discussion. Uh, it, the one thing I hope we don't do is we do see this as a monolithic issue or, or phenomenon or event because, or, or movement, because there are strains, deep strains of different things, whether it's white supremacy, whether it's anti-immigration, whether it's, you know, taking over the government. But we made, I think we made this mistake when we dealt with quote unquote Islamic terrorism on a number of levels. Um, because as, as Javed referenced to, there are organized groups um, that you could label under that very broad category but all of these terrorist groups had very different objectives. Hezbollah had a very different objective than Al Qaeda or Al Shabaab or uh, you know uh, the Taliban. It's just very, and and that's so important. Not necessarily from an operational level about how to make sure that they're not killing people, which is the most important thing. But when you're looking at well, how do you address it? from uh, um, an ideological perspective, or how are you going to counter the narrative, or how are you going to frame this so that the movements don't expand? If we don't understand the groups themselves in, in their particular units or groups, and we just try to wrap it all in one, I think we fail in really understanding how to deal with the problem. And so you had a question about, well, how do we deal with the ideology issues that, that, uh, that we deal with similar to what we did after 9-11? Well, I hope we do a lot better because there was a complete lack of understanding across the board, especially the leadership in the US government of even understanding what the problem truly was. There were people like Javed and others who were in the organizations, but certainly at the higher levels. I mean, you had the, the assistant director of counterterrorism testifying in Congress saying he didn't even under, you know, we're calling this Islamic terrorism and saying he didn't know the difference between Shiism and Sunnism. Um, we really need to understand this problem at a very almost granular level if we're going to deal with this more swiftly and, and effectively going forward. And, and I, I'm always concerned in trying to group it all into one thing as a monolithic effort. I think the naming issue has already kicked in. Um, if any of you have seen the Joint Intelligence Bulletin that was uh, published in the New York Times about what's going on, um, they've already, in, in classic US government, They've named it DVEs for domestic violence, um, MVEs for militia violent extremists. Uh, they've got racially or ethnic motivated violent extremists, RMVEs, and then the, the, the anti-government or anti-authority violent extremists, otherwise known as agave. 
um, is the, the other um, one. So this debate is going on. Maybe that's good because we do have to segment them out. But, uh, but I do think from an analytical point of view, we really have to understand the motivations, the objectives, and how they all intersect into what we saw last week. Yeah, if I can just add one thing to this, the, you know, something that's happened um, within the white supremacy movement is there was a there was a kind of a strategy in the '90s, particularly, to um, to to get involved in to to kind of um, not look overtly, say, Nazi, you know, to to get involved with mainstream organizations, anti-abortion groups, anti-immigration groups. Um, and you know other kind of mainstream conservative organizations. So, you know, which is not to say that they have all become that every anti-immigration group is now a neo-Nazi organization. But this is, you know, I, I think that we um, there in order to find people within those movements who might be willing to go to the more radical extreme. And so it's really, really complicated because I, I think that you know. I don't even think that um, one of those little designations, that, like say the militia extremists, does that mean that that they're not white supremacists? Does that mean that I mean some some may be and some may not be? So I think it's and I think it's it's really um, important. I know that I, when I was you know researching this piece I wrote a couple of years ago about this, the the lack of like really deep scholarship on this issue is astonishing to me, and I don't know where the funding has been for for the study of, of various aspects of the far right, but it, it, it was, there was really so little of it um, to, to kind of get a sense of, well, what is going on actually? So I think that that is, um, I, if, if something can come out of this, I would really hope that more money is thrown at, both in the government sector and in the private sector, is thrown at like, you know, looking at this problem and really trying to analyze it. So I'm gonna, I think there's the ton here to keep talking about, so I'm going to try to throw in some um, audience questions that I think will bring us to similar areas. So we have one about, um, as a lot of the focus ends up on sort of the way of thinking, disinformation, and also in particular the way that this thread seems to be, seems to have a much larger overlap with um, the mainstream sort of American political divisions. How does sort of free speech concerns about the way policing can um, harm that factor into what people should be thinking about doing in this? And then I just, from my own perspective, add on to this. Um, not only are we at danger of overreaching and looking at this threat, are there ways in which this jihadist or however one would like to describe that threat um, what it looks like now in the United States, which seems more sort of diffused, also largely inspired, although there's still very real organizational aspects reaching out, um, that that has become sort of a free speech issue that looks very similar, but we just don't discuss it that way. Um, and let me throw that to all three of you. I'm going to let RF answer that as the lawyer. So, uh. well, I, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, your your question completely. But is the question about how do we deal with sort of the ideological versus the organizational aspect of it of of the threat? So, I think there's sort of maybe two questions here. One is on the legal aspect. How does um, sort of First Amendment rights factor into prosecuting decisions? The tools that are used and then on a sort of societal level um, what concerns or risks come from bringing sort of counterterrorism methods into sort of the larger range of extremism issues um, in order to not sort of destroy the way that people are able to actually discuss not to police people who are not actually engaging in violence um, how to sort of draw the line on that between sort of discussion of violence as an issue and um, yeah. inspiring, sure. especially when it seems 
with some of these events, it's very, it's in the free speech space right up until it's not, whether that's because you can open carry right onto the capital grounds in many states mm -hmm. or for other reasons. So I think, I think from a prosecutorial point of view, these First Amendment concerns are always taken into consideration. They're very sensitive about those things and also just on a legal basis, having to address them if you do bring charges. But I think th this, is, this is why it's so important how we frame the issues. You know, one of the challenges of calling something violent extremism is that um, extremism, you can have extreme views and be an extremist. That is not illegal in the United States. It's not illegal in any democratic society uh, or most democratic societies, but um, violence is illegal. Um, is violence is sort of the extreme of, of the way you, you try to express something. That's where we draw the line. So when we kind of conflate the two concepts, you're a violent extremist. Well, is there a violent minimalist? Is there a violent moderatist? I, I, it, it just creates that issue. It's not about the extreme views, it's about the extreme action from a legal point of view where the government legitimately and must take action. So does that mean that everybody who has an extremist view is likely to become a violent extremist is really the question. And I think in the terms of scholarship and does it lead to that inevitably, uh, that's where we have, to, we have to really look at it. Uh, you know, it was, it was similarly complicated in the First Amendment issues about religion and getting in, in, you know, dealing with, you know, quote unquote, Islamic terrorism, um, that, you know, extreme forms of Islam meant that you were going to become violent. And that there, there really was very little evidence to suggest that that was the path towards the inevitability of violence. And so I think we have to distinguish that. I don't see us, and I hope we do not get into policing ideology as a government, that it's, it's wrong and it doesn't work <laughs> because the government should not take a position on ideology um, in terms of trying to condemn it. And you can condemn certain perspectives of, in its place in society, but to criminalize it is a whole different um, uh, approach that could certainly backfire. But do you, do you need to study it? You need, you need to do you need to study it like I I because I agree with you and I I think it's really complicated because I look at extremism as the kind of gestational phase you know this was the sort of the the, the, the bottom level um, of what would could become violence you know you, you're not I agree with you, you're not going to become violent unless you have something extreme inside of you and um, do you need to understand various ideologies and and um, I don't know the answer, but I, I don't. I I feel like you, you need to understand something about this in order to know what it is that you're looking at, right? Right, and and perhaps it could be a necessary but insufficient uh, condition to become a violent, become violent, or be the ones who are doing it. That that's true, but I think that's where we really have to look because not all people of a particular ideological bent or uh, approach, especially if they're maybe sympathizers will inevitably become violent. And I think that's, that's the key of figuring out when does that happen and why does it happen? Um, and it, and it, it's more than just ideology. There are circumstances, there's availability, there's recruitment, there's indoctrination. There's just a lot of complex issues that I think we were on the road to try to, to review those, but we need to and not make it simplistically. Well, if you have an extreme view, you are going to become X, Y, or Z violent offender. Right, and a lot of the people that do become violent offenders who are linked to an ideology are not necessarily ideological. Right. Right, like, I mean, I've, I've interviewed, you know, neo-Nazis who have told me that they could easily be Antifa or maybe ISIS. Like seriously, they could, they could go you know, from one thing to the next. There is a, there was a boy I wrote about who did go from a neo-Nazi faction to, you know, subscribing to the Islamic State, all of which took place on the internet, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he's very violent, he killed two people. So what does that mean? Who was he? And I think there's a, that's sort of another layer of it that, you know, the violent people may not necessarily subscribe, you know, even understand this ideology, right? I mean, the problem partially of 
um, because we've been fighting an actual war and then framed a lot of our other societal response as part of that actual war, even if it's not military when it comes to jihadist terrorism, that we now think of um, terrorism as the worst thing or the worst word to place on these when perhaps um, there's sort of a counterterrorism issue, but that's actually when it comes to our democracy or what we care about, really small compared to how large a segment of the population doesn't trust the government is actively seeking to sustain white supremacy in some form, um, has developed other extreme views. Um, and tied to that, let me connect that to another audience question for you all, which is how do you, or how can one restore trust in the government or is trust not really even the issue here? Are we beyond that into open political conflict? I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at the trust issue, um, even as it relates to the events of last week. Um, and you know, as both Arif and Janet have talked about, there appear to have been you know, several sort of either uh, mistakes, may not have been deliberate, but certainly you know, mistakes were made. Um, vulnerabilities were exploited, you know, seams in the way the government sort of operates or communicates um, either to itself at the federal level or at the federal level, the state and local. I mean, these are all the sort of things that had to be addressed on September 12th, 2001, right? So we're going to have to come up with the same way of thinking about this and this post post or January 6, 2021 context. But I think one way, uh, if there is a loss of confidence of government, uh, even from the security side about kind of what transpired um, last week, I think one way to get at that is to um, have something that looks like a 9-11 commission. I'm not saying you need a, you know, a commission per se, but something that basically has the same effect as a 9-11 commission. Study what, what went wrong, uh, describe it very plainly, um, and then uh, come up with a really solid list of recommended policy solutions that the executive branch could then implement for action, right? To address all those things that went wrong, um, whether deliberate or not. Um, and that I th hopefully would be one thing that could restore some trust and governance, govern government if it's lacking right now. But again, there's gonna to have to be bipartisan support in Congress. Um, the Biden administration is gonna to have to also have to agree to it from the executive branch side. So I don't think anyone knows what the answer to that is right now, but um, hopefully there's something that looks like that that will try to achieve those effects or achieve those objectives. But that would be one thing that I would be hopeful for. But again, it's, it's hard to know right now um, if that will happen or not. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I think that 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 would be an amazing step. Um, and again, it would be a statement of the seriousness, you know, with which we take this. Um, I also think accountability. I'm 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 actually I think we need a truth and reconciliation commission of some sort to just kind of look at what's happened in the country, if not in the past few years, then since 9/11. If you want to go all the way back that far, but if you just even want to look at what's happened in the past four years, it's been one crisis after another crisis, one revelation of corruption after another. These are all factors, by the way, that play into this mindset, this anti-corruption mindset. You know, they, you know. There, is, there are reasons why they distrust the government that may not make sense to us, but they make sense to the people who believe it because they believe in a completely inverse set of facts. And I think that there needs to be a kind of a national conversation around that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how, how that would happen, but, um, but I, 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 would, I think the, the, the fastest way to ensure distrust in government is to just move on and say, move on, turn the page, forget about it. Um, and frankly, I mean, I, I thought that the Obama administration made a big mistake actually in not, in not being harder on discussing issues like torture. I'm not, you know, I, I understand why, but I think that was a mistake that there could have been a, a, a much greater emphasis on looking at what happened during the Bush administration that, that Obama himself had, had, had 
run on as huge mistakes and then address them and talked about them and kind of reinforced what American values are. I think there's a confusion in this country actually about what American values are, clearly. What is, it, what is it that makes us all American? What are our shared values? What is it, you know, what, is, what does it mean? What does constitutional even mean? These are all conversations that I think we should be having. And I, I hope deeply that, you know, that begins actually in the Biden administration. Yeah, if I could just say I mean, to, to the fundamental question that, that's been so answered so well from uh, my colleagues here, I, I just think when you ask, you know, is, is trust in government important, you know, trust in government is always important. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's about political uh, uh, leadership, policing, or public health. I mean, we are seeing the damage that's caused from the lack of trust across the political spectrum in government, um, just in getting basic facts and, and the truth. Um, and, and anything we do in response to what's happened and what we're now, you know, many people are now realizing in response to this domestic terrorism threat, it's the trust in the government that will carry it through. If there's distrust um, that the government is being overzealous or being disingenuous or not, you know, not telling you the truth about it, you will have a greater disaster than what we have right now. So the restoration of trust in all levels of government is just so critical. Um, and I, I really do think fundamentally that's the challenge of our time um, to address any of these social issues. Let me combine a few questions to see if we can group them and get through some of these. Um, so one, I'm going to paraphrase as, what's the deal with QAnon? Um, and then I think one that's not necessarily fully tied, but is similar is, what is the role of ritual and religion in um, parts of these movements or the broader coming together of the various movements that were active at the Capitol or more broadly in um, America's extremism problem? So those are the questions that I'm asking um, other people right now. <laughs> um, I'm actually trying to understand that myself. Um, I, I am, um, I mean, QAnon is a conspiracy theory um, and, um, with, with a long history that I actually, I, I'm not expert enough on to just hold forth on right now, to be completely honest with you. Um, in, uh, so I'll answer the religion question. Um, it, it is very interesting in what I found as a journalist, it, it has been very interesting that um, the people that I have found or heard about um, who have drifted into this extreme QAnon believing um, um, you know, Donald Trump is infallible um, believing movement is, are, are, tend to be um, conservative Christians, evangelical Christians. There is a, a, a kind of, um, again, that doesn't mean all evangelical Christians are this way. Um, or even all conservative Christians are this way, but there does seem to be a link between a kind of um, an ability to give oneself up to faith and what is required of you to be part of, 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 a, of this type of extremism um, or any extremism. And I mean, I think he's obviously, if you see religious religion in, in other extremist movements, um, in, Islam, in jihadist movements, for example, um, but I, it, there is a there seems to be a direct link between um, Christian I mean Christ, Christianity and 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 some of these um, movements and and certainly you know if you've seen like there are people that were carrying a flag that said um, oh I can't remember it, 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 there's there's a there are people carrying flags that link directly link Trump to Jesus this movement to Jesus. So there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap, is I guess what I would say. But um, but I'm in the, I'm in the process of actually reporting on that myself. So, and I'll uh, I'll jump in on that to a degree, not as um, much uh, um, on the sort of um, the Christian identity part of this, or kind of neo-Nazi or occult type um, symbols and and um, iconography that is that is apparently showing up. 
Um, but as Jan has said, it does seem to be important for some people, right? Um, either you know, sort of draws you in to these ideas or beliefs or activates you for, for violence. But think about the same thing that had been weaponized, as Janet mentioned, for jihadist groups. Both Al-Qaeda and ISIS managed to take the, the shahada, right? The, the most simple profession um, of the Muslim faith that declares that you are a believer. And they managed to make, that, make the shahada into a, a banner of jihadism, which it sounds crazy, but they did, right? That's when people refer to the black flag of, of Al-Qaeda or ISIS. Those are the words that are on that black flag, usually within, within white. Um, but again, it's so offensive to most Muslims to, to see how those groups have weaponized, again, the most simple profession of, of just believing in Islam. Um, and that is another example of how symbols and religious ideology can be symbolized towards violent action. There's, a, there's an or, one of the far right organizations is called the pa Patriot Prayer. There's a lot of overlap in, in not just iconography, but also just in the language. And there, you know, we're, um, I mean, Christian identity is a great example of this, but, um, but there is, um, I, I, I really think that this stuff has been very much woven into, um, there is a certain strain of conservative Christianity that has been woven into many of these um, movements and, um, and the QAnon movement seems to sort of pick up on it. There's a, there's a to, to give you just like a, a kind of a quick example, the distrust to, to, to invert it, there is a profound distrust of atheists in this movement. Atheists equal communists equal leftists equals Democrats equals pedophiles. You can you can go right and, and I mean, if you're an atheist, you know who are God. If you're a godless communist, you're a godless communist. If you're a godless communist, well, you're allied with the liberals and the Democrats, and the Democrats are so evil, they're pedophiles. I mean, this is actually a continuum of thought within. QAnon. So, I mean, how you can only get that there if you have an inverse type of faith. You know, if you have if you have deep if you have deep faith in something else, an unquestioning faith in something else. It's an absolutist mentality that is um, that is found in certain kinds of very you know in fundamentalist or very fervent um, forms of faith. Basically, so so I mean I think, and again like that's something that you know that when you look at when you look at you know QAnon it sounds crazy like why are Democrats pedophiles why are they drinking the blood of children, and then you sort of rewind it and it's like oh right and then Joe Biden is a is a puppet of the Communist Party and why do they hate the communists and and you just kind of rewind this backwards and you just see that there is it's kind of rooted in this this dislike of atheism. We have a question here on. Um... We've been discussing some of the various strands that come together, how they've been knit together and some of the tensions. Um, is what we're seeing now the creation of what will come to view as a new movement label? Um, whether you want to call that like an extreme Trumpianism or MAGA or something else, um, is that new? Has it overwhelmed sort of what might have used to have been fighting groups and changed those origin points in a structural way. And let me add to that, um, it's what we're seeing usefully understood as new or via those various points, or is this just what the right has really always been in many countries, or at least one, not the right always been, but one expression of right-wing politics that this potential was always there. There's not a need to name it something new. Certainly there's always been a range of like political violence to defend the status quo that brings together a variety of these things. Um, so let me throw that to you all. I think it's a movement. Um, I do think it's a, I think it's a movement. I think it's on one level, it's not new. Um, on another level, I think it's very, it's not very well understood. Um, and, um, I, 
I, I mean, in, I think by saying this is not new, we don't want to then say it's not important. It's really important. It's just not, it, it is, it, you know, have we seen similar things like this in other parts of the world? Of course we have. Um, should we take this, this MAGA, whatever you want to call it? I don't really know what you want to call it. I, I think it's, I think it's the, this MAGA movement that's way beyond Donald Trump or Trumpism. You know, should we take that really seriously? I, I really think we should. I really think we should. Um, and I also really think that we need to understand that this is rooted in, in, in different ideologies and different social movements and different forms of extremism, white extremism, whether it's organized white supremacy, whether it's organized neo-Nazism, whether it's organized the organized militia movement, um, whether it's the organized anti-abortion movement, the anti-immigration movement, these are all strains of far right thinking that have in some ways come together or woven, woven themselves in the gut. The, the Second Amendment movement is huge, huge, huge in this. And some of these movements have woven themselves together in various ways to, to manifest in this way. And I think we need to look at this and understand you know, what this is about. But these, these movements have been around for, for decades, if not longer, I mean, forever. But for decades, they've been on the radar for decades. How much importance would you all put on Trump as individual and Trump's use of the White House as bully pulpit on the dynamics we're seeing now? Is he essential to that weaving together um, as it's sort of expressed in the riot on the Capitol? Or would these movements have come together if we say had a Hillary Clinton presidency for the past four years? I think they would have been worse. I think it would have been worse with Hillary Clinton. I think Trump in some bizarre way because of his authoritarian tendencies kind of clamped it down. I think these, these, these sentiments, these feelings, this anger, this desire for some kind of revolution was there long before Donald Trump was elected and had Hillary Clinton been elected and fulfilled any of the sort of fears that, that those on the right had about her, um, it could have been a very dangerous situation. And I mean, no, which is not to say, I don't think Trump is the leader of the troubadour of this, of this movement and that he didn't incite these people. I believe that he did. But I also think um, this is bigger than Trump and will, and will still be here without Trump. Um, and, and actually, if you wanna, you know, the, if, when you do look at certain, um, there's a nihilistic faction in this movement, the accelerationist faction, that, that couldn't care less about who your leaders are. They're just about burning this whole system down. And that's, you know, they're thrilled by all of this. And that has nothing to do with Donald Trump. It had nothing, it, it, it has nothing to do with the, the guy at the top or the woman at the top. It has to do with the system itself. And I think that is actually growing. I think though, if, if I could just add real quick to the job of that is, um, I do think, though, that with Donald Trump in, in the presidency and all the people who followed him within the government and all of the um, sort of legitimizing of what he said and what was done and, and sort of the, 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 in the attempt for the media to be objective by giving equal weight to sort of the two perspectives, that has had a sense to legitimize a lot of the things that he was doing. And it went from dog whistling to just full on blaring a, a, a you know, a, a parade of trumpets on, on some of these issues. And the fact that that happens, it, I think it, it, it has created much more of a, maybe a sympathizing movement or maybe a broaden the movement. I agree, it wouldn't have gone away. He's not the singular reason. I think he's more of the manifestation of it. Right. But I, I would really, um, I don't think we would be where we are on this without that sort of legitimizing effect, which is why I think it's so important that we delegitimize it. And you're right. seeing that happen. And I think the the shutdown of these these, in, especially inciting violence, et cetera, and marginalizing that aspect of it is really important. Um, I mean, you can't put it back in the box. Is the thing that I'm thinking, like you. Sure, but you can mitigate it, I, I, I think. And you're going to have to do many, many things in order to address this problem, just as we have with other similar issues. But I do think his, he has had a tremendous impact, as well as the entire political apparatus that's followed him. Yeah. I and mean, if you look at not only with the success of running over, but 
they didn't dissuade the people who said they were going to vote against the, 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 the election and kept perpetuating these, these falsities about the, 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 the nature of the election. So uh, the, the empowerment that has come from this, I think is significant and, and it'll be yet to be seen what happens in a few days. So we don't have much time left, but there's one really important issue we meant to get to and we should prioritize in our last eight minutes here, which is um, what, what are your thoughts and what are the problems that emerge from the purchase of this movement, these movements, these ideologies within law enforcement, the military, and also various other agencies that may not be those but touch upon public safety issues, may see, may see intelligence products, maybe in a sort of veto point over important things. Um, especially with um, so many National Guard being put into DC at the moment out of the pretty clear failure of the level and of policing on the, um, that led to the, or not led, but allowed the, the capital um, siege and riot. I'll, uh, I'll take a crack at that first. And I apologize for the color changing on my screen. I have no idea how that happened. It just, that's, Welcome to technology. Anyways, um, so on that issue that, you know, is very controversial, uh, very complex. I don't think there's a single answer on it. I'll just give you my own personal insight. As a former national security and counterterrorism professional like Arif, uh, when you take these jobs, whether in the military, the law enforcement, the intelligence community, you take an oath. You take an oath to defend uh, or uphold the constitution uh, and protect the country from all threats, foreign and domestic. So to think that there are people either former or active in any of these professions who uh, are promoting ideas or taking concrete steps towards violating that code or that, um, that oath that you take, it's, it's one of the most, it's one of the saddest and most disturbing aspects to this, right? Because I just can't get into the mind of someone who thinks like that, having been a former, professional myself, where every day you wake up and you're like, what can I do to, to um, make the country safe? Not the complete opposite of what's happening. So that's my own personal insight into this. You know, it's, it's really disturbing to see the level of, of what this looks like right now. I, I have a question, I mean, maybe for you, Javed, like the FBI, for example, they knew, they've known for years that, that white supremacists had infiltrated law enforcement. But the public didn't know. I mean, there were, there were these you know, internal intelligence reports since going back to the mid aughts about this. Um, so I, I don't understand um, what could have, how this could have been dealt with or why it wasn't dealt with, but it is, it is it's obviously it's an enduring problem. It's not just a new thing. They've been, this has been going on for quite a long time. And, and we've seen these groups like the Oath Keepers or the Three Percenters you know, that are, that go directly for law enforcement and, and, and military. Um, and uh, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm very interested in what the, what the federal government is doing about that, especially since some of the members are members of the federal government, so. Yeah, I'll take a swing in R if you have your own insights too, <laughs> but just very quickly. Um, you know, my observation, having you know been in the FBI uh, as an analyst, a senior analyst um, for on counterterrorism, is that um, there was there was efforts made to sort of look into this, um, but it wasn't strategic, right? There wasn't the same sort of centralized, strategic, integrated sort of programs that were designed to look at the jihadist threats, both both at home and abroad. And whether that was the right reason or the wrong reason, it just it was a fact, right? We just didn't have that. Um, same kind of level of prioritization, not only at the FBI, but lots of other parts of the national security enterprise. Um, so, you know, obviously there's going to be, um, you know, a lot of hard conversation now about why that strategic effort hadn't happened in the past or didn't start earlier. So I can't say it was completely ignored, but again, it wasn't prioritized the same way. It wasn't looked at the same way. 
Um, and that, you know, led to, you know, different outcomes. But RF, you know, you, you saw this too. Yeah, I mean, part of it is, I mean, the, the FBI, I, I, certainly of all the federal agencies have taken this seriously in a way that no one else has over the decades. Uh, I, I think what, um, having been inside the bureaucracies of many different agencies is that they don't operate by themselves. They don't make decisions independently. Um, I mean, to, to Director Ray's credit, he, in recent hearings, he was saying domestic terrorism is the greatest threat we have. Um, and this was not that long ago. Um, but I would never underestimate the political pressure that leadership, especially in Washington, are under on these types of issues, which often emanates locally. I mean, and this is not just only the, this administration. I recall when I was appointed to the Department of Homeland Security um, in 2009, uh, there was a product that was produced by the Department of Homeland Security Intelligence and the uh, FBI released talking about this specific threat, especially of former military and law enforcement who were part of militia and white supremacy movements. And if, if, for those of you who remember, it was, it, was, it was soundly rejected by many in Congress as being ridiculous and being absurd and, and basically forcing the department to retract it. This was 11 years ago. So they, you know, the departments don't act in a vacuum. They're heavily influenced by things. And then also just lastly, you know, agencies go where the resources are provided. The agencies don't determine what resources they get. It's Congress, it's the political establishment that decides where their budget goes and down to how many agents you're going to have investigating a particular type of crime. Um, and that can often lead where the resources go to, to do the things that they want and try to do. Well, we're pretty much at time, which is unfortunate since we have a ton more questions. And really, I think that's the reflection of how there may have been or was a broader failure to have these discussions publicly to the extent it needed to be. Let me give you each a very quick chance for any concluding remarks. And perhaps um, as part of that, or if you don't have anything we left out that you want to bring up, what might surprise you about um, this issue area over the next 10 years? Or what do you think people might not expect that might become a big part of the issue area? Um, I, maybe I'll just start. I think uh, I, I've seen this in policing in particular and other things that it's times like these that are catalyzing moment to shift and change things that we need to do. If you look at any way, any law enforcement, public safety agency has ever responded, it typically happens after a uh, tragedy or something that jars the country that creates this momentum. Every earthquake code in California is directly correlated to a major earthquake right before. Um, and, and I do think this is that opportunity if directed in the right way for us to be stronger and and I think we'll be surprised with the resilience of, of this country. Um, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish about this, but I do think given everything that we've all experienced and how exhausted and emotionally drained we are, um, we, we will emerge um, better, um, still have these very deep seated problems. They're not gonna evaporate, but I am optimistic that um, this will, because we have these opportunities to talk and we have very good people who wanna do the best in public service, and in the community that we will, we will be able to get through this. I mean, I'll just add that um, kind of jumping off what uh, Arif and Janet have said, this is an enduring threat that is probably only going to grow in intensity in the coming years. It's not sort of specific to, you know, Trumpism or Magism, whatever you want to call it. You know, as Janet has described, you know, the history here goes back 30, 40 years and we're just seeing the latest crest of it. Um, and at the same time, the government has to change, right? I mean, there has to be a paradigm shift in the way we think about domestic terrorism, at least at the federal level, and what new resources, tools, capabilities, uh, authorities, you know, bureaucratic structures, that all has to be figured out in the, in the coming years. And then, you know, with these really big pendulum shifts at the same time, we can't take our eye off the ball of the international terrorism threat, right? Because we've seen when that happens too, um, you know, bad things can happen. So this is the, you know, this is the real sort of challenge for counterterrorism of, you know, you move too far on one end of the spectrum, then 
other threats kind of fill the void. And so we're going to have to figure out a way to maintain some level of equilibrium and balance, but also flexibility to, to shift as, as threats um, change rapidly as well. I, just, I, I, I will reiterate what I said before. I think there is a huge opportunity for um, a kind of a national conversation and a, 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 you know, from, from a, you know, a, and a political conversation and, and kind of a reckoning with all of this um, and recognition that um, for whatever the reasons, it, this issue has not been um, taken quite as seriously as, as international terrorism um, and without necessarily, you know, deconstructing why that is, because I think we've all sort of done that. Um, I, at least journalists have. Um, you know, there, I think there needs to be a conversation around, okay, well, now we're going to treat it seriously. So how are we going to treat it seriously? How are we not going to violate people's um, First Amendment rights? I, I have a, I'm very divided on this point because I'm, I'm a huge civil libertarian, but I also see how the First Amendment has been used in ways um, to just not really pursue things that could be pursued. Um, and I think there, th that, um, I'm hoping that we kind of really sort of reevaluate what, you know, what's constitutional, what's not. What, what are Americans allowed to do? Um, what are they not allowed to do? Are they, you know, you can have any ideology you want. You can say whatever you want, but if you say something that incites a riot, that's a, that's a crime, you know, and, and we need to sort of understand what the lines are. Um, and I don't think we do that. I actually do understand that. So I, my hope is that this opens up an, a, much larger and longer national conversation. And if we could have a, a 9 11 Truth Commission type thing, I think that would be an incredible step forward and, and very positive. Well, thanks to all of our speakers. I'm sure this topic will not be going away anytime soon. And there's so much we didn't get to, but we did get to a lot. And again, thank you to you all for a great conversation.